Um, so thanks to those who hopped on our breakout session this afternoon. Um, I'm very happy to be joined and be moderating this session by two good friends and colleagues uh, from Hooper Lundy and Bookman, Jeremy Scherer and Mark Reagan. Um, I've mentioned this before, I'm Reed Clifton. I'm the project manager at the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center and I am always around. So I'm gonna pipe down and let these two fine gentlemen speak. Thanks a lot, Reed. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeremy Scherer. I'm with uh, Hooper Lundy and Bookman, and today with my colleague Mark Reagan, uh, we're going to be talking about post acute care, which we sort of think of as the next frontier of, uh, of telehealth. So let's dive in. Uh, next slide, Jason. Who are we? So, as I said, I'm Jeremy. Uh, I am in our Boston office. I'm coming to you from Newton, Massachusetts. Uh, I am the co-chair of our firm's digital health practice. And really what that means is I am the telehealth guy uh, and also working on AI and other sorts of digital health issues. Um, this is my uh, either third or fourth year at uh, doing one of the uh, telehealth resource center conferences and I'm, I'm excited to be back. Uh, in, in terms of my practice, you know, we as a law firm exclusively represent healthcare providers and suppliers, which basically means uh, we work with a lot of healthcare provider facilities, a lot of hospitals, a lot of uh, SNFs, others in the post-acute uh, spectrum, medical groups and others. Uh, I work with them on telehealth issues for the most part, as well as physician contracting, compliance, other things like that. Um, but at the same time, we in the digital health space, we also work with a lot of telehealth platforms uh, from those who are, uh, pre-funding startups just in their launch periods, uh, all the way to several of the largest in the country, some of whom are publicly traded. Um, that's the quick, for, the, the quick version on me and who I am. Uh, Mark, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Mark Reagan. I'm the managing partner of the firm uh, based in San Francisco. My second home is Boston uh, and uh, look forward to being there again. It's been a while. Uh, I've been practicing in the post-acute and long-term care area for three decades, uh, represent the uh, Massachusetts Senior Care Association as general counsel, same for the California Association of Health Facilities, and also work with the American Healthcare Association in a number of capacities outside counsel, also members, uh, a member of the legal committee, reimbursement committee, and reimbursement cabinet. My practice is really sort of uh, more sector-based. Uh, I do uh, reimbursement, operational, regulatory, uh, public policy work for the skilled nursing industry uh, in those particular capital cities of uh, California and Massachusetts, as well as in DC. And I uh, have enjoyed uh, presenting with uh, Jeremy for some time now as we've finally seen uh, a much more significant uh, in, uh, introduction of telehealth services into the post-acute and long-term care sector, obviously uh, sort of supercharged by virtue of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks, Mark. Can we go to the next slide, Jason? Uh, we wanted to make everybody aware of this uh, website that our firm is maintaining on COVID-19 uh, updates and resources, uh, state level developments across the country, um, it, which we're continuing to maintain and a lot of clients have, have found helpful. Uh, next slide. So what are we going to talk about today? So we'll start just by doing a, a general primer uh, on the legal issues that folks need to be aware of in the telehealth space, including uh, when utilizing telehealth in the post-acute context. Um, and then diving into telehealth and post-acute care, I'll talk about uh, sort of how telehealth tends to make sense in post-acute environments uh, before talking about what CMS has done to expand its coverage of telehealth during the pandemic and in particular, focusing on the elements of that expansion, which have most helped folks in the, in the post-acute world. Uh, after that, we'll turn things over to Mark, who's gonna talk about sort of getting into the weeds and understanding uh, post-acute environments and the issues that are relevant there pertaining to telehealth technology. Um, we're gonna talk about sort of why over time, the uh, adoption and utilization of healthcare technology in the post-acute space has been, has been slow, if we're being honest. Um, we're gonna talk about how uh, 
folks at skilled nursing facilities, SNFs and others have successfully leveraged telehealth during this pandemic, and then talk about the operational challenges that have come up in this context, as well as what the priorities are for post-pandemic as we look forward. Next slide, please. So to begin, we're gonna talk about state law. And the reason is that the practice of medicine in the United States is regulated on a state-by-state -state basis. And uh, so too, therefore, telehealth is regulated on a state-by-state -state basis. And so the law that applies when a practitioner is uh, providing services via telehealth is the law of the state in which the patient is located at the time that the services are furnished. So as sort of a, a fundamental step one when looking at legal issues in the telehealth context, it's understanding state law and the obligations of those who are, uh, who are providing services using this, uh, these modalities, I should say. Next slide, please. So to begin with, licensure. So again, it is the, is the state in which the patient is located where the practitioner needs to be licensed when furnishing services via telehealth. Um, every state uh, across the country in, in one capacity or another uh, wants to know when there are individuals providing clinical services to residents of that state. If you sort of take a step back and think about it, it's a fundamental consumer protection interest. And generally speaking, what that means is that a clinician needs to have a license that is issued by the relevant professional board in that state. Now, there are exceptions there, uh, but typically, you know, looking at, at Minnesota, for instance, a state where uh, you see a lot of times folks are saying, well, do you really need to be licensed there? And even though that licensure doesn't need to be obtained, there is still a registration process with the state medical board for physicians in Minnesota. So as a general principle, what I, what I often say at a 30,000 foot level is, the, the professional board in the state where the patient is located wants to know that professional services are being furnished there, whether that's by way of licensure through a registration process, et cetera, um, takes a little bit more research. But if you're walking into a state uh, virtually and providing services there without letting any regulator know, it's probably uh, time to take a step back and, and uh, examine things a little more closely. Uh, Practitioner-patient relationship establishment is another important issue. This was really at the forefront of what uh, those of us uh, practicing law in this space were dealing with a, a few years back, and it, it was litigated uh, to great effect uh, in the state of Texas between the medical board there and uh, Teladoc, a, a national telehealth services provider. Uh, the question had been whether a practitioner-patient relationship can be established to be a telehealth. On, in saying telehealth, we mean that live uh, two-way audio video interaction, or if, uh, pre if, if there needed to be an in-person interaction beforehand to establish that relationship. At this point, uh, a practitioner-patient relationship can be established uh, nationwide via telehealth. And again, telehealth meaning uh, what we're doing right now, this live two-way uh, audio video interaction, basically a, a fancy way of saying time Skype, Zoom, et cetera. Um, but where this conversation has shifted to now is other forms of technology. So a, a lot of platforms are utilizing uh, online questionnaires, smart questionnaires to do sort of intake and, uh, and gather information about a patient and then provide that information to a clinician to make a, uh, a, a treatment determination. Um, on a state-by-state -state basis, it's important to look at how telehealth is defined and what the medical boards and other professional boards have said about the modalities that can be utilized when uh, furnishing services via telehealth. There are some states which explicitly prohibit the utilization of smart questionnaires. Some states will say that uh, audio-only communication is not telehealth in and of itself, but if you are using audio only communication in conjunction with the review, for instance, of state, uh, or excuse me, uh, patient medical records um, and, and other documentation, that that can be okay. So that's another issue to look at state by state. Um, states are all over the map as far as consent requirements. Uh, some require a practitioner to, to obtain the patient's consent before providing services via telehealth. But in California, for instance, that consent can be verbal or written and it needs to be documented. There isn't much more than that. 
uh, on the books. So it is important if you're providing services to uh, to Medicare and, and Medicaid patients to look at those standards. There are some requirements in California's Medi-Cal program, for instance. Uh, other states have very strict requirements as to what needs to be included in those consent uh, documents. Some will say that they need to be uh, in writing and signed by the patient. Uh, again, it's important to, to look at that state by state. Um, just like anything else, uh, fraud and abuse laws apply in the telehealth context. So too do privacy laws. Um, it's important to ensure that in addition to federal laws that we're all uh, familiar with, the federal anti kickback statute, the self-referral prohibition known as the Stark Law, HIPAA on the privacy side, there are also state level obligations which need to be satisfied. And again, when, uh, when a practitioners providing services via telehealth across state lines, you need to be looking at the laws of the state in which the patient is located. Um, the corporate practice prohibition is another issue that varies considerably state by state. Uh, it, for healthcare facilities, when you're uh, contracting with outside groups, it's important to ensure that if a, a medical group is organized, uh, for instance, in a non-corporate practice state, to ensure that if they are coming and providing services to patients in your state, if it is a corporate practice state, you need to ensure that that medical group understands their obligations in the way that they need to be structured to avoid uh, running afoul of the corporate practice prohibition. And uh, documentation, documentation, documentation. Again, this sort of falls into the fraud and abuse and, and privacy bucket, saying that services delivered via telehealth are, are not uh, different clinical services. This is a different way of delivering clinical services. So it's important to satisfy any applicable documentation requirements. Um, there have been modifications to many of these rules during the pandemic. Uh, those too have varied on a state-by-state -state basis. And while uh, they are very important right now, it's important to note that absent uh, legislative and regulatory action, uh, we will be returning to pre-pandemic uh, rules once uh, each state, uh, once the federal emergency is declared over, and then on a state-by-state -state basis as we move forward, it's going to be important to track uh, track those developments to make sure that if you're relying on a waiver or relaxation of uh, any of these state level requirements um, that you're in compliance with the law. Next slide, please. So now we'll move into sort of the, the heart of the presentation and talking about telehealth value in, in the post-acute world. Next slide, please. So in terms of Medicare's coverage of telehealth, uh, historically, Medicare telehealth services, uh, as outlined in the Social Security Act, need to meet uh, a, a list of, uh, of requirements to be reimbursed. Uh, among those, and, and among the most challenging in the, in the post-acute space, are the originating site and geographic restriction requirements. Now, the originating site requirement uh, effectively states that in order for a patient to receive a Medicare telehealth service and have it be covered at the time that the service is provided, the patient needs to be located at an approved category of originating site. Now, skilled nursing facilities, SNFs, are approved originating sites. The, the difficult issue here is the second component of the requirement, which is that on the, on the geographic side, that the originating site needs to be in a rural health professional shortage area or a rural HIPSA unless uh, an exception applies. Um, the problem is most skilled nursing facilities are not in rural areas. Uh, and as a result, their residents are, are not able to obtain services via telehealth that will then be covered by CMS. And on its face, of course, under, the, the logic is there and it's understandable that, um, that a lot of post-acute facilities have said, well, if these services aren't going to be paid for, can we really provide them? Because folks generally assume that in order for something to be financially viable, you need to obtain payment for it. But what's interesting about the, about the post-acute space is that while in certain situations, telehealth services won't be reimbursed, there is still a value add because there are other very expensive costs that can be reduced through the utilization of telehealth. Next slide, please. Emergency department visits really are, are a huge uh, a huge issue for post-acute providers. The transportation, getting folks to those emergency department visits uh, is expensive. 
Um, and it can also be it can also be dangerous for folks who are particularly frail in the in the post acute space. If a patient can be treated on site via telehealth instead of being taken into the emergency department, uh, there's great saving. Or there are great savings to the SNF because they've taken away the expensive uh, transportation costs, which again, transportation is also dangerous. Uh, but it's also important to note that under the SNF value-based purchasing program right now, the way that that is being structured in part is that 2% of, uh, of SNF reimbursement is being withheld. And Mark, please jump in if I get any of this wrong, but my understanding is that 2% is, uh, is being withheld and is then made available to the SNF uh, based on its, based on its uh, successful lowering of readmission rates. And so by keeping folks who have been discharged from the hospital then out of uh, the hospital and ensuring that you don't have these uh, unnecessary readmissions, that is another source of cost savings, as it were, for the SNF. And so pre-COVID-19, in this landscape where we did not have reimbursement of most Medicare telehealth services in uh, non-rural SNFs, this was sort of the, the value proposition and how we had to look at it, plus the fact that when patients stay in the SNF and don't then go back into a, into a, a hospital environment, there are additional inpatient days, which of course uh, will be a source of reimbursement from uh, the Medicare program. Next slide, please. So now uh, we're gonna talk about the, the topic on everybody's minds really right now, sort of how telehealth has evolved, particularly in the post-acute context during uh, this current pandemic. Next slide. So this is just restating what we, what we were just talking about, that the value proposition in SNFs has been about reduced readmissions, reduced costs, and also uh, additional inpatient days, uh, as opposed to reimbursement, but that has changed in this current landscape. Uh, next slide. So the first thing that we talked about in the Medicare context was the originating site uh, restriction. And for the duration of the public health emergency, that has been waived. And so what that means uh, more broadly is that uh, patients can receive treatment wherever they're located, including in the home. Um, again, the, the most important issue in the long-term care context, particularly for SNFs, is this rural-urban distinction um, but it is important to note that the originating site requirement has, uh, has been waived and that that can be important to others in the, uh, in the post-acute continuum, uh, home health agencies, for instance, uh, who are furnishing services to folks who are located in the home. Um, a very important development during this pandemic has been the expansion of, quote, Medicare telehealth services. And Normally, in order for uh, Medicare to cover a service that is furnished via telehealth, it needs to be included on a list of Medicare telehealth services. It's a list of CPT and HCFIX codes that's uh, updated annually through the physician fee schedule process, and it, it literally sits on the CMS website. And if a service isn't included on that list, uh, it is not covered uh, under Medicare Part B. During this pandemic, CMS hasn't gotten rid of that requirement in that services still need to be on that list of Medicare telehealth services, but it has drastically expanded the list of services that are, uh, that are on that Medicare telehealth services list. There are about 80 new codes that have been added, which has really expanded the types of services that patients can receive via telehealth, uh, including the addition of certain audio only codes uh, during this public health emergency, which has really made a tremendous difference in the, uh, the post-acute space, particularly because as Mark's gonna talk about, these are oftentimes not, uh, not facilities that have the infrastructure, the technological infrastructure to, uh, to be able to provide audio, video, telehealth services right away. Next slide, please. So some of the particular services that have been uh, expanded uh, and, and can now be provided via telehealth, uh, first are initial nursing facility visits. Normally, uh, when, when a patient is, is presenting at a, at a skilled nursing facility, 
the initial intake uh, services provided by a physician can't be provided via telehealth uh, right now for obvious reasons that has been waived. Uh, the same applies to discharge day management where normally there is a, well, th there remains a role for uh, physicians to play there. Normally that can't be provided via telehealth, but again, right now, because of what's happening in, uh, in SNFs, uh, regarding this pandemic, that requirement has been waived. Next, uh, next slide, please. There are also frequency limitations that have been in place over time on, uh, on telehealth services in SNFs. So for instance, uh, for a, a clinician who is a patient's primary clinician in a, in a post-acute environment, uh, they're able to provide what are called subsequent care services in and what that means is that it is after the patient's initial uh, intake, uh, but those services normally can only be provided via telehealth every 30 days. That has been waived during the pandemic. Same applies for uh, critical care consults. Normally there are frequency limitations there. It can only be done once per day, but because of this overarching objective to limit in-person contact, particularly in, this, in the SNF context and other post-acute facilities, uh, that frequency limitation has been waived during this pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Again, uh, a sort of similar concept, but in the, in the hospice context, there's normally a face-to-face -face requirement uh, for uh, certifications of continued necessity for hospice services that, uh, that need to be furnished in person by a, uh, by a practitioner, uh, and that requirement has been waived. During the uh, during the public health emergency, and that was something that didn't happen right away at first, but uh, did come about through some um, successful advocacy efforts by uh, by folks in the industry. Um, uh, another issue that was not addressed uh, right out of the gate, but uh, through the uh, town hall uh, meetings that CMS has been doing over the course of the pandemic, um, was eventually expanded and changed was uh, therapy benefits, which are often provided actually by uh, post-acute facilities, uh, largely SNFs. They, they, it is the facility that is considered to furnish those services. So it was important to clarify that when services are provided via telehealth by a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, or a speech and language pathologist who is not physically located at the facility, uh, it was important to clarify that those services were still, uh, could still be provided via telehealth, and that is the case uh, during this uh, pandemic. I think Mark will talk about that a little bit in uh, his portion of the talk. Next slide, please. Uh, communication technology-based services refer to uh, virtual check-ins and e-consults. So these services are not Medicare telehealth services, meaning they're not uh, they're not subject to the uh, reimbursement requirements that are uh, set forth in the Social Security Act. And so that means the patients can receive these services wherever they're located, um, including in the home. And the the rural urban distinction doesn't apply. Uh, those services continue to be available to SNP residents as they were before the pandemic. The one change that CMS has introduced here is that normally uh, these, these check-ins are only for uh, clinicians to engage with their pre-existing patients. In other words, you can't establish a relationship with a new, uh, a new patient through a virtual check-in. Because of the, the pandemic and concerns about limiting uh, in-person interactions, that requirement has been waived uh, for the duration of the pandemic. Next slide, please. It's important to note that um, a lot of folks have been talking about this and privacy is a huge concern in the healthcare space and rightfully so. Um, HIPAA is administered by the Office for Civil Rights at HHS and early on in the pandemic, uh, OCR came out and said that they're exercising enforcement discretion and they're waiving penalties for uh, violations of HIPAA, which is important. Uh, normally using uh, non-secure, non-professional platforms um, runs the risk of, uh, of making protected health information uh, vulnerable to, to, uh, to any sort of inf information security uh, issue. And uh, what OCR has said 
is that as long as you're providing services in good faith, we're not going to we're not going to come after you effectively during uh, during this PHE, which is important in the post acute context because, as we've discussed, many of these facilities lack uh, sophisticated technological infrastructures that can be required to provide these services. But what's important to note here is that enforcement discretion is not the same as a waiver, and and what that means is that. Here, OCR has not necessarily committed to waiving obligations under HIPAA and saying that you are safe for the duration of, uh, of the public health emergency. What they've said is that during this public health emergency, they are exercising enforcement discretion, but that policy could change at any time. So it's important to be mindful of uh, information privacy, security, and, and your obligations, and to keep a, a careful eye on the enforcement landscape and what is coming out of OCR, as well as on the state level. Uh, next slide, please. That is it for my section of the talk, and I'm going to turn it over to Mark now. Mark, take it away. Thanks, Jeremy. So the purpose of the first part of my discussion is really to talk about and level set sort of for everybody where sort of the post-acute and long-term care world has been with respect to healthcare technology writ large. And then we'll move into a bit about uh, how things have changed and sort of what's happening on the ground. Next slide. So unlike other types of healthcare providers, there was not uh, additional funding or subsidization of the skilled nursing industry for the adoption of uh, healthcare technology as part of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, that was obviously a missed opportunity for the industry and one that honestly set it back for quite a while. Um, within the skilled nursing industry, there are a, there's pretty significant variance of the types of entities and organizations that uh, operate skilled nursing facilities. And they range from a single independently owned operator to a large publicly traded company. And then uh, kind of all sort of points in between both nonprofit and for-profit. Uh, as you can well imagine, uh, those organizations with greater access to capital were more early adopters of healthcare technology first through an electronic medical record, and then more sophisticated aspects of healthcare technology, particularly trying to uh, work with their primary uh, acute care partners and primary care partners through integrating healthcare technology. But it has only recently been the case that essentially virtually uh, a, a every or the vast majority of facilities uh, adopting at least EMR-based technology. So we begin this conversation uh, with a sector that is behind or has been behind with respect to healthcare technology and uh, is catching up. And what we've seen, I think, during the pandemic is by virtue of some of the challenges or obstacles that Jeremy referred to, uh, if you've talked to uh, a SNF organization about telehealth, you've really just talked to one SNF organization. They have various different levels of both sophistication as well as capabilities, and their particular vision about how telehealth could assist in terms of their delivery of services, cost containment, and the like, some of the issues that Jeremy spoke about, can be widely varied under the circumstances. Next slide, please. So the world changed and has changed and continues to change in very many ways. And as folks probably see through uh, reading social media, uh, consuming news through the various channels and reading online newspaper content, the skilled nursing facility industry has greatly struggled during the pandemic. And that is largely the function, I think, of really three things. Uh, number one, uh, acute hospitals were really the first priority for public policy makers uh, and guarding against surge conditions that would make it essentially so acute conditioned patients would not receive care and services. Number two, skilled nursing facilities have probably the most single at-risk population 
uh, for the COVID-19 virus. And once a, the infection may enter a skilled nursing facility, it is very difficult to be able to alleviate or mitigate to a large degree uh, the spread of that particular virus. And that's because of the third prong, and that is that there was really uh, a lack of coherent, consistent guidance, and truly, and not to anybody's fault, an insufficient understanding about the spread of the virus in that skilled nursing facilities for those places that were experiencing surge conditions or were trying to avoid surge conditions, uh, put pressure through uh, county decision makers, state decision makers to take admissions of either COVID positive patients or those who had not been tested to be COVID positive. Uh, and those who had not been tested as uh, or uh, symptomatic at the time were believed to not at the early portions of the pandemic to pose a risk of, of transmission. What sadly we found out thereafter was that that was not the case and that there could be robust asymptomatic tra uh, transmission of COVID-19 and that has really adversely impacted the skilled nursing industry. Next slide. So uh, one of the things to, to realize is that once it became clear that the skilled nursing provider and the skilled nursing center was a place where everything could and should be done to be able to build essentially a cocoon around skilled nursing facility patients. And I think generally speaking in more significantly populated states, uh, currently there's only 20 to 25% of skilled nursing facilities have not had COVID-19 infections either of residents and staff. Staff in skilled nursing facilities often, not always, but often work in more than one facility. And uh, largely the caregiving world is comprised of nurses and nurse assistants, some of which are largely women of, of color com, uh, coming from lower socio uh, socioeconomic backgrounds that have had disproportionate uh, statistics of community spread. And so it has been a real challenge to both maintain staff at a skilled nursing facility, as well as to build the cocoon that I've described around it. And a lot of that cocoon on the first instance had to do with shutting out visitation. Uh, and not just visitation from family members, which has been obviously its own significant socio, uh, so, you know, sociological impact and uh, a real driver, I think, of increased depression around skilled nursing facility patients. But it also opened up the ability of skilled nursing facilities along with the particular waiver provisions that Jeremy was talking about to be able to make it so that other care providers, physicians of various types, uh, physical occupational speech language pathologists and other uh, rehabilitation specialists, and those who did not have to actually, given whatever their, their particular modality of treatment was, physically enter the building uh, could be uh, removed essentially as another risk factor. And that was a real driver with respect to uh, the use of telehealth in the post-acute world. Because all of a sudden, if uh, you had primary care physicians uh, that uh, had existing relationships with patients who did not have to be physically present in the facility, that's advantageous to both folks at the facility, it's, it's also advantageous to the particular physician. Same thing goes for specialists, in that if a specialist consult could be delivered without regard to the rural versus urban distinction, uh, that makes it so that the specialist will have um, you know, uh, no risk to them, and likewise, there will be lower risk to the skilled nursing facility. And Truthfully, what this feels like at the moment is that you have a pretty significant check-in process for anybody who comes to a skilled nursing facility that includes temperature checks, the uh, filling out of paperwork, and truthfully, uh, it's a lot more efficient and honestly based upon the feedback that we've received from skilled nursing providers, a lot more dynamic 
to actually have specialty consults involving specialist physicians that not only involve the individual patient at a skilled nursing facility, but also the primary care management staff. And that ends up being significant because if you contrast that from the pre-COVID era, you had probably a nurse's aide, a company in a non-emergency transportation uh, modality, a trip to a specialist, and the uh, nurse assistant would be with the patient to ensure the patient's safety. They would visit the specialist. They'd go back into the transportation van and go back to the skilled nursing facility. As Jeremy indicated, there is certainly risk with that, and there's also wasted time. But uh, more importantly, the only uh, folks as part of the skilled nursing care management team who are there for that particular remote consult is a single uh, CNA. As compared to uh, a licensed nurse, perhaps the director of nursing, or another uh, member of the care management team with a great deal more sophistication associated with the assessment and care planning for that particular resident that now is being able to uh, not only view and listen to the specialist consult, but, but actively participate in that particular conversation. So that has been a service line that within specialty care, I think, uh, folks who are now using telehealth services by virtue of uh, the more f the, the increased flexibility have found that there are true advantages associated with it. Now, does it take away from time, uh, from their time that is spent conceivably serving other residents at the skilled nursing facility? Yes, it does, but it does create a more meaningful specialist consult uh, from from the primary care management staff and obviously I think from the actual residents standpoint. We have also seen the use of telehealth uh, more recently and uh, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen the use in the behavioral health side. Uh, the, the need for behavioral health supports has been one of the fastest growing areas within the skilled nursing population because skilled nursing residents really uh, very much need that help. And there is a dearth of behavioral health providers who are willing to serve this particular population. And so from a behavioral health consult standpoint, one of the places where the use of telehealth began in the skilled nursing arena really was on the behavioral health side. We have also seen growth that uh, predated COVID um, that has uh, continued and to some extent expanded from uh, primary care services, particularly for on-call and after-hours coverage. Why is that important? Well, uh, during the what's known as the knock shift and within a skilled nursing facility, it is the time that most residents are asleep. And it's the time where the least amount of staffing interaction is necessary under the circumstances. You have the lowest number of staff people there, oftentimes during the knock shift. There are not med passes going on. Uh, all of the uh, food has been served, consumed, and cleaned up. And uh, this is a place where historically that if there's been a change of condition by a particular resident during this sort of overnight shift, uh, facility representatives were uh, found it very difficult to be able to reach the attending physician to get some direction about whether or not the skilled nursing resident could be triaged at the facility or whether they should be sent out to an ER and an acute care hospital. Oftentimes, the default was to send that particular individual out to an acute care hospital, which in light of the value-based purchasing program that Jeremy spoke about, really uh, became a pretty significant disincentive for, among other things, for skilled nursing facilities to uh, have conceivable admissions or even visits to ERs uh, that were unnecessary. And so the use of the telehealth platform for on-call services, oftentimes paid by the skilled nursing facility itself, rather than trying to uh, bill for it by virtue of the rural versus urban distinction, was uh, something that uh, providers found helpful for that particular purpose because they could ensure a more meaningful consult again uh, during, an, during a, a late night shift with a particular resident change of condition. 
Next slide, please. So, as I said, uh, one of the first elements that happened during the pandemic was the shutdown of non-essential visitation. Uh, and that, that had a significant driver all of a sudden to how can we implement the care plan effectively that includes uh, having to assess and respond to particular needs that could be only cared for through having specialist consults, also the ability to provide access to rehabilitation Sometimes uh, the nature of the underlying rehabilitation uh, needs to be physically present uh, and not through uh, the use of a telehealth platform. But oftentimes what we found is that although it may not be the most optimum modality to use, there are aspects of physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech language pathology, depending upon how acute the needs of the individual patient are, or how uh, well the patient can uh, use the telehealth technology, as well as how much they're able to retain and work on themselves in between particular visits is sort of where the sweet spot is, I think, on the PT, OT, and SLP side. Uh, so uh, facilities have been spending a lot of their time, honestly, uh, doing infection control, and infection control has been the uh, primary uh, function, primary emphasis of skilled nursing facilities to be able to uh, effectively either keep out COVID-19 or to, as many facilities have done, to essentially have three wings within the skilled nursing facility, a yellow, green, and a red wing, uh, one wing for COVID-infected individuals, uh, a green wing for COVID naive individuals and a yellow wing for folks who uh, um, have, uh, have not been uh, uh, tested as positive uh, but have conceivably been exposed. And so what you have is you have essentially a, a SNF operating in a three to one uh, sort of uh, basis right now where you have by virtue of the prevalence of COVID-19 infection, you have wings that look very different. The use of PPE and the use of, uh, which is personal protective equipment, uh, N95 masks, shields, um, also uh, much higher levels of donning and doffing of gowns. These are, real, uh, these are real circumstances in skilled nursing facilities today, and they've continued to struggle to both access for PPE and States and localities have struggled by virtue of uh, the, uh, both the presence of testing as well as not, oh, not only if you can get resident and, task and staff tested, but how quickly can you turn around that test? Because if you, if you test everybody but you can't figure out the results for three to four days, that's not gonna really serve you well when you have the dynamics of this kind of an event happening in skilled nursing facilities. They're also struggling with uh, overlapping and sometimes inconsistent or contradictory directives from various elements of either national, state, or local governments. Uh, and so all of these things sort of go back to the notion that however care can be organized in the simplest and least intrusive way during the pandemic, in a way to be able to focus most of staff's efforts around infection control and uh, trying to manage the different wings without uh, you know, cross-current infections and trying to uh, make it so that there are not additional introductions of COVID-19 into the population has really opened up the ability to use telehealth in a far more consequential way. Next slide, please. And so where would the skilled nursing industry like to go? I think that the skilled nursing industry uh, has seen the advantages uh, and the possibilities for the future to be able to uh, more efficiently deliver care uh, from specialists who are willing and able, to, oh, depending upon their area of specialty, to participate in a, tele, in a telehealth consulting world. Uh, the skilled nursing profession, generally speaking, has struggled to uh, have physicians interested 
in the, ger in the geriatric population. That has primarily impacted uh, the access to primary care services rather than specialty services because historically specialty services uh, would be uh, delivered in the specialist's office. Uh, and the, as I referenced before, the patient would be transported there. In the pri on the primary care side, it's been much more of a challenge for the skilled nursing provider to get primary care physicians interested in serving in those capacities. So uh, skilled nursing facilities, I think, that have had a taste of telehealth see it as not only advantageous from the standpoint of not having so much disruption and risk to their particular population in terms of the, the, the provision of specialty physician services, but they also see the ability to use telehealth in a more effective way to prevent unnecessary trips to the ER or unnecessary patient ad, ad, admissions that can be triaged more effectively through the use of this particular platform. As a result, I think that you will see a lot of conversation about the elimination of the rural slash urban distinction. And Jeremy and I have seen pieces of potential or offered legislation doing that same. That would be the game changer for fee-for-service Medicare to uh, eliminate that particular distinction. And it will be interesting to see what a lot of the telehealth-driven data will look like after the pandemic in terms of the efficiency, because a lot of the pushback in terms of the elimination of the rural-urban distinction has been the concern over the overuse of telehealth services. And I think that there is an opportunity to be able to show policymakers that that, that is not a real risk. I, co I contrast that with CMS and other policymakers being much more open to the use of telehealth services in the Medicare Advantage world. For those who are not aware, the Medicare Advantage Part C program is a program whereby beneficiaries of the Medicare program can choose to have their uh, care and treatment delivered through health plans rather than through the fee-for-service system. In those environments, it's the health plans who are fiscally at risk. CMS has been historically, within the last couple of years, much more willing to be able to use a, an increased and more robust telehealth platform for, uh, to be used in a number of environments, including skilled nursing, because presumably the health plans are on the risk. And so it may well be that in those marketplaces that have very high levels of MA, Medicare Advantage par, uh, participation, you will see the use of telehealth technology expand even further, particularly if we don't get some post-pandemic relief off of this urban-rural distinction. Next slide. And here we are. Uh, we are to questions. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, folks have gotten a sense of that, that the, the skilled nursing world is a wide open marketplace. Uh, uh, and obviously it will be shaped in part by the post pandemic policy, but within the public health emergency world, there is a lot of opportunity, I think, for folks to be able to uh, explore with a variety of different types of uh, skilled nursing facility operators about how to effectively use telehealth. We have uh, the expectation that the public health emergency, which is currently set to expire on July 25th, obviously just a few days away, will be extended next week for another 90-day period. So we're expecting that the public health emergency and the telehealth waivers that we've been discussing here today will be in place at least through mid-fall, if not beyond. Jeremy. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think at this point, we're ready for any questions that folks may have. Um, so you can see four here on the screen right now. And for folks who are wondering about the disembodied voice, that's me, Reed Plipton. But Jeremy and Mark are more than uh, comfortable enough with answering their questions on their own. And so I'm just going to kind of let them keep the stage. So uh, you, if you'll just have Jason sort of 
tell the ask him to scroll down when you get to the part where you can't see the questions anymore. You do have a couple other stuck under there, but you got a fair amount that you can talk through. Sure. So I'll take uh, I'll jump in with the the first question up here, and just so I know, Mark, the the questions are visible to you as well, right? Yes, they are. Okay, great. Um, so the, the first question I see is, can you talk a bit more about the existing patient distinctions across the modality, e-consult versus asynchronous versus video visit at the federal level? And the second part is, is there a majority stance at the state levels? So on the first part of the question, whether uh, what the existing patient distinctions uh, look like from modality to modality, at the, at the federal level. So really what we're asking about there is the Medicare program. And uh, generally, the, for the most part, the existing patient requirements are actually a, are really a, a scope of practice issue, meaning that they're addressed in state law as opposed to federal policy. Usually you need to look to the laws of the state in which the patient is located at the time that the treatment is furnished to, uh, which will dictate whether or not there needs to be that pre-existing relationship. Um, as to what the majority view is and sort of what's emerging at the state level, for the most part, we're moving away from the uh, requirement for a prior in-person evaluation. In, in most states, that is not the case. The, the one, or I should be clear, it is not the case that you need to have that in-person examination first. Um, I will say that one area where that is not the case in terms of federal law is uh, prescribing practices and, and uh, controlled substances where it is still the case that unless certain narrow exceptions are satisfied, there needs to be a prior in-person uh, evaluation of the patient by the practitioner to prescribe uh, controlled substances via telehealth. And the only thing that I would say on the, the e-consult asynchronous video visit question, I, I, for the most part at, at state level, the the existing patient requirements won't uh, get to the level of granularity of, of talking about uh, differences between different modalities. It's just important as you move through that uh, progression to, to be mindful of the amount of clinical contact that is or is not present. Because ultimately, if a clinician is questioned by a, uh, by a professional board, what they're going to be concerned with is probably less at this point whether you were physically in the same room or not, but instead they're going to they're really going to look holistically at the interaction as a whole and whether that professional board believes that the clinician got enough information and had enough interaction with the patient to be able to uh, provide services in a in a clinically competent way that satisfies the applicable standard of care. Okay, Mark, are there any that? Uh, jump out at you? Well, yeah, I'm going to hit the ones, uh, you know, do I think skilled nursing facilities have enough broadband in their facilities? Generally speaking, yes, but uh, just because of the wide variation between facilities and uh, the amount of, of uh, capital and the amount of technology present, but yeah, uh, I think that it's something that needs to be assessed, obviously, uh, with respect to each potential target for skilled nursing facilities. And it may be that that the rural versus urban distinction may have some real meaning here in terms of the strength of the particular broadband and the amount of investment that they've made in that regard. That's something that I, I think needs to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. But generally speaking, I, I'd say yes. Um, the, the SNF care management team does look similar across organizations and state lines. That's because the vast majority, not the only, but the vast majority of skilled nursing regulation is federally based uh, through uh, the requirements of participation, which are set forth in, in uh, 42 CFR section 483 at SEC. Uh, and they speak to specifically the assessment process, the care planning process, and they use the term interdisciplinary team, which is a defined term with respect to those requirements, which end up standardizing how, 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 how the care management team will be comprised. Um, and, but uh, you have facilities operationalizing those 
depending upon the individual needs of the individual resident, because you may have uh, more participation with different sort of skill sets of their of that care management team, depending upon the needs of the individual resident. Um, uh, this one, I, I'd like us both to maybe talk about it. Um, do I see value in distinct telehealth rooms within SNFs for patients? Um, yeah, generally speaking, I do, uh, but I know that within the pandemic, there are particular challenges associated with that from the standpoint of infection control, cleaning, um, and having to go through all of that. But, you know, quite frankly, that's happening. You know, a lot of patient visitation just separate, um, uh, separate from the notion of, uh, of uh, 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 patients uh, being able to see uh, loved ones through the use of you know, iPads or other tablets, they're having to be constantly changed as well because you know, one of the biggest, you know, uh, you know, biggest uh, sort of, not by cost, but biggest sort of purchasing uh, aspects that we've seen during the pandemic are, are skilled nursing facilities purchasing tablets for individual patient use, largely for visitation. But those are also being used um, in, you know, as well as for uh, COVID-19 pandemic telehealth visits. So um, I, you know, quite frankly, you know, your typical skilled nursing facility is not is 99 beds. Some are smaller, some are bigger than that. Uh, but um, but what folks have largely found in a lot of environments is that they can use tablets in their individual rooms. And the only obstacle, I think, has to do with how prevalent the use of telehealth is and then the cleaning and disinfecting sort of aspects of it. Um, and then, and then um, can you address consents for telehealth and SNF? In general, do you find SNF tend to include an admission consent to treat or address separate uh, documents. You know, the uh, issues of contracts of admission are state regulated aspects. So for example, in the state of California, there's a standard admission agreement that really cannot be altered by the skilled nursing facility. So the consent to treat uh, or consent associated with telehealth would be certainly something that would be done separate from the consent for the skilled nursing facility to provide care and treatment. So, uh, but that's a state issue about how consent is uh, handled, whether it's SNFs or elsewhere. The only thing I'll just jump in on the consent question, Mark, you know, the, the one thing to add there is that uh, it's absolutely important to think about consent from the facility perspective, but it's also something that, uh, that needs to be considered by clinicians who are involved and what we encourage uh, SNFs we're working with to do um, when there are uh, when they're entering into arrangements with uh, outside groups who are going to provide coverage via telehealth is to ensure that on the operational side there's something in the protocol which uh, in the in the clinical protocol which basically instructs the the clinician to verbally just confirm that the patient is okay, receiving services via telehealth and understands that receiving services via telehealth doesn't in some way um, uh, prevent them from receiving treatment uh, in person instead. Um, so it's sort of, there are two levels of it there. Um, there's a question on here about asking about the uh, rural urban distinction and how it differs from a HIPSA area. And and the way I, I guess I'll answer that is that the the, term rural in this distinction is effectively a synonym for a rural HIPSA. The way that rural is defined for purposes of the rural urban distinction is that the uh, provider facility needs to be located in a rural health professional shortage area, a rural HIPSA. Um, so I hope that that answers, uh, I hope that answers the question. Um, I, Mark, I agreed with you and, and what you said about distinct telehealth rooms versus using devices which are mobile. Obviously, uh, there needs to be, uh, I mean, there, there needs to be sufficient connectivity in order for those devices to, to move across rooms. But um, I think that goes without saying. Uh, I'm not, 
there's a question on the topic of HIPAA. Can you speak towards what a BAA does and does not cover? Um, I would encourage whoever wrote that, uh, please feel free to follow up with me via email. I'm not sure exactly what that's getting at. It depends on what's included in the BAA, of course. Um, and a BAA is meant to, to pass uh, obligations under HIPAA along to, um, to a, a provider or a subcontractor, but I think I would need a little more detail on what we're trying to get at there. Um, Reed, where are we? Where are we time-wise? I think we've gotten through all the all the questions at this point. Is that right? Yeah, I was just about to say that that actually is probably a good way to sort of segue. Um, folks, if you are interested in getting Jeremy and Mark's uh, emails, I believe they're both on the profiles for the their speaker profiles for the app. But um, I would also be happy to facilitate a connection for you. Um, they, they obviously, they know their stuff. I'm very thankful that you guys are here. Thank you. It was a great conversation. Uh, we do have a couple of folks that are still online. And if you have a question that you didn't get a chance to type in and you want to unmute and ask live, you're welcome to. Otherwise, um, we have a bonus session of the exhibit halls at one o'clock today. Um, and so I would encourage folks to use the 15, 14 minutes or so that we have um, to get up, stretch around a little bit, maybe get some water, some food. Um, and then sort of look at some of the industry partners that we have available for you to talk to for the next hour. And yes, thank you, Jason. Um, as you leave this event, besides maybe typing a quick thank you to our fantastic speakers here, um, please do hit the evaluate uh, the session feedback button under, uh, the, under the where you joined this video platform. That's also where you'd be able to download the slides that the speakers had today. Um, and that way they can kind of hear from you, from the folks that got to listen to them today, what you thought. And I think that's about the end of my spiel. Thank you both again. Truly, truly thank you. Thank you, Reed. Thanks, Reed. Thanks, everybody. Always a pleasure. Take care.